Remember the old time wedding processions? I don't know what they did in Milwaukee, but I remember as a boy serving weddings in Detroit, how after the wedding mass in the morning, they would go to the reception, not after about three hours worth of picture taking as they do today either. They would organize themselves fairly quickly and the bridal party's car would be decorated and off they would go merrily with a sense of triumph and joy with their horns blaring. It was a triumphal procession, very joyful. Now picture such a wedding procession, and I'm sure it must have happened sometimes in the old days, running into a funeral procession. Maybe a particularly sad one, say, for a young man. No horns, but you used to turn your headlights on, and everything was somber and quiet. Remember those little flags the undertaker used to put out on the cars? I don't know if they still do that now. And then they run into each other. This collision sets the scene for today's gospel. If you can think about it, then St. Ignatius would say, well, you can meditate. Because that's what he, that's what, that's how we teach to med- meditation. So you picture the scene, you fill in, as children would with a coloring book, all the detail you can think of, and more, and then you color yourself into the picture. Our blessed Savior in the Gospel had just worked the Domine Non Sum Dignus miracle for the servant of the son of the centurion. And word had gotten out what had happened And St. Luke says, now our Lord has a multitude with him, and they're following him in joyful expectation. What's going to happen next? And they want to get in on it. Well, they won't have long to wait. But then, this joyful procession, bam, runs into the gates of Nahum, a most mournful funeral procession, and the mood changes. Our Lord sees the widow bearing her only son, who is meant to be then her sole support. And our Lord, seeing the widow, thinks of Mother Church, and seeing the dead young man, thinks of so many young people who, as the way of the world is, will grow up and away. Then he looks again, and he sees the young mother, and in her he sees his blessed mother. Never mind. A miracle is coming. How's the miracle going to get worked? By means of the wood. The wood of the cross. He approaches the beer, not the kind of beer you get in Milwaukee that you drink. That's an old word with a different root, and it was a kind of a stretcher in effect. The the, the body of the deceased would have been shrouded, as was our blessed Savior on Good Friday, and it was kind of a stretcher in which the shrouded body was carried off to the tomb. Our Lord approaches the beer, He touches it. He touches the wood. That's everything the fathers of the church say. And those who were carrying it, the pallbearers, they stood still. He stops them. And our Lord stops the burial procession. For he himself, why does he stop? He's touched. He stops then to perform another miracle, and this one was unasked for. Remember the first one with the centurion. Oh my goodness, and he was a pagan. And how beautifully phrased and how humble is that prayer. The church can do no better 
than to have us say it before our communion at every Mass. Oh Lord, I am not worthy. But this time, it's an unprayed for answer that's given. If it is true that sometimes our prayers seem to be unanswered, also remember that there are times in your life when you never got around to pay, praying for something, but our Lord remembered and he granted it to you. He who himself would carry the wood of the cross in order to, why? To bear our burdens. St. Paul, the epistle, is touched by the widow's tears and he carries her burden quite away. Young man, I say to thee, arise. And that's all there is to it. Now, the operative word I'm thinking in today's Mass, the Epistle and the Gospel, is a verb, to bear or to carry. Those are two English translations of one Latin word, portare, as in a porter, who used to carry people's luggage, and they still do sometimes if you need them in an airport. A porter, one who carries. Our Lord is the divine Porter. St. Paul today urges us, bear ye one another's burdens, and so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. This has the sense of um, the epistle of mutual forbearance. If somebody needs your help, or you're supposed to kick in and just contribute a little something, St. Paul is saying, don't sneer at them when the usher comes by with the basket, or when there's a sign-up sheet in the vestibule. And St. Paul uses the word for sneer, which means to draw up your nostrils. That's the literal meaning of it. If they ask for help, don't be offensive, at the very least, he's saying. Don't insult them whether it be a real insult or maybe you can't manage it this time, you didn't mean it, but they took it the wrong way. But still, St. Paul says, well, be careful. And be not unforgiving when it's your turn. And your turn will always come around. I mean, to be rudely or uncharitably treated. So it's more than just a kind of a vanilla admonition that you'd get in the Novus Ordo, which is always some version of be nice. No, it means specifically, take the time to stop. Be sympathetic to somebody else's problems, yes, but more, put up with others when they offend you, or even scandalize you. In other words, they do or say something which, in effect, makes you fall and commit a sin. Oh, and when you find them, people, really annoying, and you'd usually stop to say something sharp, don't. Bear the burden, like the pallbearers in the Gospel. To be a pallbearer is considered to be an honor or maybe a family obligation. Sometimes, I've seen, depending on the steps and the distance of carrying the casket, it's actually very hard work. And so it is with life. Bear the burden of another trespassing, walking across your property. Thus, this is the interpretation of St. John Chrysostom and also of Thomas Akempis and the imitation of Christ, two very sure sources. Now, who gives the very best example of this after our blessed Lord himself, if not she whom he sees in the figure of the widowed mother? Jesus, moved with mercy, says, we not. Well, we should want to be able to say the same thing. 
he, our blessed Savior, she, the mother of the Savior. Now, as a mother, she should, and as a mother, she would bear the failings and the sins, even the grievous ones, I mean even mortal sins, of her children. We are her swords, and there are more than seven. What a burden, and yet she bears it, because she is the mother of Jesus, and thus is she the mother of all who right now are members of his body, his mystical body, the church, or who once were, or even those who once were called and never came. She's the mother of us all. That's the meaning of our Lord leaning forward on the cross and crying out to be heard, Mother, woman, behold thy son, son, look, here is thy mother. He, Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of the work, he bore our sins in his flesh upon the tree, and she bears them in her heart. She too, a mother, bears the burden of her children's sins and and the sufferings by which Jesus atoned for them. So that we might understand in, in modern terms, she comes to Fatima, a little over a century ago now. But don't forget that God sent an angel a year before to prepare his mother's way. And there's that wonderful prayer that the angel taught the children, most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly. That's a prayer to say frequently in the day and always when you come to church and always at communion time to make reparation, the angel taught the children for the, for what? The three sins. Outrages, sacrileges, and what's the third? Indifferences. That's what always gets me. Indifference is the, who cares? The, a shrug, if not a sneer. No interest here. No second look. Just move on. And that calls for, from our part, reparation. Reparation allows us to join the procession, to express our sympathy, to join the procession, to express our joy, as we look for the next miracle to come from our Lord, to carry and to bear a bit of the burden ourselves, to do our share. Back to the verb, portare, to carry or to bear. St. Paul uses that in the epistle, St. Luke in the gospel. Friday evening, after the six o'clock, the fathers, and there will be three priests here, and what an honor, and one of them, himself freshly ordained, just in June, Father Caleb Sons is his name. The priest will bear the body of our Lord, carrying the sacred host and the monstrance, with your help, in a short but a solemn procession, which is both the wedding feast of God and man, the miracle and rejoicing, only except instead of horns, they're just going to be the chimes of the altar bells. And then it's also a burial procession, because in this sacrament, St. Paul says, we show forth the death of our Lord. And everything about it, especially the 40 hours devotion, has a sense of a, of a funeral, of a wake. There are the candles and the flowers in abundance, and, and everything is quiet. There's kind of a hushed reverence. There's watching and praying. As people used to, you used to have wakes for a long time, two nights, even three in the old, old days was not unusual. Praying, 
pleading, offering reparation here. Join us. Join us for the processions of joy and of sorrow. It's a two for one. But you need to stop and to stand still a little bit in your regular weekend activities. And when you come, you might have occasion when you go to want to blare your horn because it may be that you will have received your miracle. Bear for a bit next weekend. Carry for Christ the burden he and his mother bear for you all days. He waits here, and mostly he's alone, but not next weekend, the time of the greatest joy and the saddest sorrow. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.